the more you kind of give and give out there, it only comes back to you. And I, I think if you can just, you know, throw all that out there, I think it's a benefit. Episode 88. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enoch Bartlett Sears. And if my timing is correct, this is the first episode of the new year. Congratulations on making it through another year. And, you know, I just have many, many wishes of success for you in the year ahead. It's exciting. It's going to be an awesome 2015. I'm sitting down here today with Alex Gore. We're going to continue our conversation uh, talk a little bit about the technical side of producing documents. They've, uh, him and his partner have set up a pretty slick system of templates in Revit to be able to produce uh, construction drawings pretty quickly. Now, Alex is a principal and co-founder with Lance Psycho of F9 Productions, a residential design and BIM creation firm based out of Longmont, Colorado. He is also the co-creator of RevitFurniture.com, which provides Revit families, template files, tutorials, as well as teaching at the University of Colorado at Boulder in the environmental design and architectural engineering departments. He's also the upcoming author of the book, The Architecture of Thinking Different, Getting More Out of Design and Life. So before we jump in today's episode, I just want to remind you that today's show is sponsored by BQE Software. I just want to thank Stephen Burns, the whole team over there at BQE, for reaching out to me and saying, hey, Nick, we love what you're doing. Uh, we'd like to help sponsor the show and let people know about what we're doing at Archie Office. So Go check it out at archieoffice.com. They have financial and project management software specifically tailored for architects. And once again, just want to thank them. So, Lance, um, dude, I keep on saying I'm going to have to edit that out. No, don't worry about it. Keep it in. It, it's all in the flow. Um, sometimes our interns call me Lance. Sometimes Lance's kid calls me that. It happens all the time. <laughs> Welcome back to the show, Alex. <laughs> Thanks, Enoch. So, hey, since it's... Since it's 2015, um, new year, can I just talk about goals for a second? Dude, let's do it. It's a great time to do it, yeah. So I, I think a lot of people set goals, and I think it's great. And I, I set a lot of goals, and last year actually was a learning curve. And this might seem obvious to a lot of you, but my I wrote a whole bunch of goals, and then I said, I'm not going to do all those. So I crossed everyone out but write a book. So that was my only goal for the year. And then all of a sudden, six months into it, you know, I, I had thoughts, you know, when you try to write, you don't, you don't know exactly where you're going. So I had a bunch of different things and I go, I need, I really need to finish this up. And what I realized that is that I didn't have a system in place behind the goals to keep them accountable. So now my system is I, every morning I write for at least 30 minutes. And if I don't want to write for 30 minutes, I write, I say, open your computer and write for two minutes because the hardest start step is starting. So then if I write for two, I'll, I'll normally go on for long, longer. But I, so my only piece of advice for anyone setting goals, which you should be in, in 2015, it's a good New Year's Day. You're probably watching some football, you know, doing all that, listening to this. It's just, if you write a goal, try to write a system uh, behind why you're trying to write a goal. And if you can just do those two things, hopefully it'll help you out. Well, tell me more about your goal. So when you write in the morning, what are you writing? So I'm, I'm, I'm writing the book. I'm writing... Um, let me make sure I get the name right. You know what? The name's probably going to change. Um, right so here I have it. You sent it to me as the architecture of thinking different, getting more out of design and life. Yep. So basically, it's an exploration of um, what what we've kind of done and, and how to how to kind of produce more, um, how to think different, um, and it basically boils down to a couple different points. One is you know give yourself um, new inputs, new creative inputs, and that comes from what a lot of people do. With, is Art Daily, Art Record, you know, all that other stuff. I, I read a lot. Um, in college, what I would do, a lot of people go down and look at the magazines, but I saw a whole bunch of VHSs. So um, what I did is I, my grandma gave me her VCR, and I'd go and watch those. And I got a great idea for this concrete d design that won a competition just from, just from looking in those different places. Mm. Um, so then ask yourself, you know, different questions, right? So uh, while I was building the, the chicken coop, um, a lot of chicken coops are basically, you know, craftsman design. And I go, it's crazy how all these chickens agree that they only like craftsman design. And then I thought, maybe maybe they want something different. So I, so the chicken coop, you know, I go, there's going to be a roof, so why don't I slant it and collect the rainwater? And then why don't I bring that rainwater in and use it to, you know, 
for the chickens to drink and then funnel that out into the garden. And the garden will make lettuce and the chickens will eat lettuce and then I'll get eggs from the lettuce. And then I thought, then, you know, I didn't have enough money to build a house, so I actually put probably too much time in this. So I made a, a stone trom wall to collect the heat. You know, I did the overhang right so that the sun wouldn't hit it in the summer, but in the winter it would. I put plexiglass over the front so it, you know, it would go in. Um, I even built a straw wall, which is probably not needed, a straw bale wall in the back, just to see if I, you know, I could do it to make it super insulated. But there is one benefit to this, and that is uh, Lance's chickens have basically stopped laying eggs. Um, because it gets colder, that's what they do. So he maybe maybe gets two a day. And I think I still get five or six a day. So I'm pretty sure it's the architecture that's making that happen. There you go, man. Um, Documented doc- ROI of architecture. Yeah. Design. Yep. And then and then the next step is, you know, is holding yourself to another standard, to a higher standard. And and that you know, um setting those goals for yourself. And basically the book is about um that process through different designs, kinda like the little nuggets um that, that I just shared with you, just more expanded on and, and, and more nuanced. Cool. So you set aside that time to just get started writing. So that's a great way to talk about goal setting and and doing it. Any other thoughts on goals, Alex, before we move on? I think that's it. <laughs> so you guys are using Revit architecture or Revit you know, to, uh, to do the designs and the construction drawings that you guys do. Uh, kind of unheard of with the smaller design, especially in the residential design from what I've seen. I find yeah. that the smaller firms a lot of times will use CAD or they'll use ArchiOffice. Uh, I'm sorry, they'll use um, ArchiCAD. Yep, sometimes so, Sketch too. Yeah. I see. So you guys have background in uh, in Revit then? Yeah, so um, if you missed the previous show, we went into kind of the background of, of how we started building BIM models. Um, and then after that, we, we started, um, we wanted to do volume based in the recession and get lower level, um, additions and clients rather than, you know, shooting for the moon. So that we, we needed to make a system and we needed to become very proficient at Revit to execute on that. And then we started teaching other architects how to do it, um, other designers. And then the third, we started hiring our firm because we started growing. And um, we wanted we wanted our interns to know more, so we went to see you, and we just said basically we had a meeting and said how can we help out, and then they said do you want a job, so he said okay, so we started teaching um, the engineering students at first how to draw, draft, and how to design because the engineers um, if they only do um, you know calculations stuff like that in at CU their fourth year they actually do a design project, and it's sometimes hard for them to get out of that thinking. So we introduced that in the, the beginning by teaching them Revit. So now they have the skills to, you know, put their ideas on paper and then know a little bit more about design. And now we now we're teaching in the uh, environmental design program, which is the precursor to architecture in probably a bunch of different schools, depending on, on how it's set up. Um, so we teach them too. So then we get a lot of feedback from them going from desk to desk, you know, seeing what they're doing and asking their questions and being like, oh, okay, this is how a lot of people are thinking. That's not really working out. In our next template update, make sure we add this or this, or you know, put this in so that it, it's smoother or cleaner. So it's all about just building on what we've been doing on the past, and then offering that up. Because um, you know, you've probably seen this. I mean, I think your show is evident of this. And the more you kind of give and give out there, it only comes back to you. And I, I think if you can just you know throw all that out there, um, I think it's a benefit. So are you guys using Revit because it's it's quicker, it's more efficient, or because it's what you guys know the best? So in the beginning, even um, one of the projects I talked about last time, we did the massing in SketchUp. Is it, you know, because we, we thought it was quicker and stuff like that. And once you get dialed into Revit, um, I, I can speak to AutoCAD. I can't speak to um, anything but AutoCAD or SketchUp. I think this is almost this is one of the best systems to use Revit in because you can't really lie when you cut a section. You know, there, there, it, it's wherever you place that wall. If it's a sixteenth of an inch off, it's going to show you. And how we developed our model based off of the fundamentals is looking back and thinking, um, how would the building actually get built, right? So if you think about, you know, you make your, um, you know, your foundation, your footers, and then you put a floor box on. And then on top of that floor box, you put your, you know, your stud walls. And then later you come back and you put in your, your finished wall. 
So our walls are built in that two-part system. Our ceilings are built in that two-part system because you have, you know, um, your floor box for your ceiling or, or, or your cords for your rafter, and then you have your gypsum. And your gypsum goes on the inside of the finished wall where those rafters sit on top of it. And the reason why that's important is because then you can get those material takeoffs. And then when you're cutting sections, even if you're passing it on to an intern or something like that, you're getting in that notion that we, we don't lie, we don't fudge. Uh, everything that we kind of learn in Revit comes from the real world. So that it, it, there's, there isn't, it, if we can take away that disconnect as much as possible and not have you even thinking, you know, like, oh, this is the way I drew it, but out of the, you know, that was just lines. Where when you're cutting in Revit and maybe drawing over it in details of a, a, a filled regions or something like that, you see the structure behind there, and you can't you can't kind of make it up. If, if you make a detail that goes over like where your structural floor box is, you better look and make sure you know are those 16 inches or 17 inches, and go back and change that, or else that's going to mess up you know either your bulk plane or your head height or or, or or something like that. So we feel that maybe it's a little bit harder in in, in the beginning to learn, but it's been it's been such a tool for us at the end that that we just love it. You know, I've heard, I've heard comments from senior architects saying, uh, you know, Revit is spoiling the, the future generation of architects because they're not learning how to put together building details. They don't have to draw it. They don't have to figure it out because it kind of comes out of the box. What would you say to that? I, I would say that's the opposite of true. I, I would say that um, in uh, architects, in, when, when you work in CAD, I see, a, 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 you know, you just, you just take the detail, apply it over, maybe change, you know, stuff like that. I would say the opposite is true in Revit because when you make that detail over it, you have to look at the model and you have to see if that's the way that the, you know, the model is built. So you have to, you know, uh, take any dissidents and, and, and ration it out. So I would say Revit is actually more of a learning tool of how to build. And, and I can't, you know, I can only speak to AutoCAD, which some people have developed really sophisticated AutoCAD programs and stuff like that. But I remember, and I won't name any of the architects, but Sometimes, um, and I know this, and I've looked at, I've looked at drawings. Like they don't want a dimension because, and it seems really weird because that's your job. They don't want a dimension because they don't want to be liable for that dimension. They want you to feel verify or something like that. And that just seems the opposite of of where we're going. We want, we are trying to convey to our clients that your house is literally getting built in this 3D world. And it's, it's actually, in the 3D world, it's actually to scale. It's only when you apply the views that, that you scale it down. So we're making it as best as possible, the most realistic representation of that. And based off of knowing that what, when, when you're working and when you're setting stuff up, we, we know and everyone at our firm knows that um, we have the philosophy behind design it like it's going to get built. And I think just that fundamental principle in the back of our head Helps helps us navigate, you know, um, iffy situations. Hey, Architect Nation! It is great to have you listening in today. I want to remind you that this episode of Business of Architecture is sponsored by BQE Software, the developers of Archie Office. Archie Office has been powering architecture firms for over ten years and helping them to be more productive and profitable which empowers architects to do what you like to do and what you got in this business for in the first place. Create great architecture and spaces. Go check it out at archeoffice.com. Now back to our show. What would you say to firms that are looking to improve their efficiencies? How do you guys use Revit in a way that enables you to produce drawings more quickly but also maintain a high quality control? Yeah, so... Um, one would be, I would say, get um, all your common pieces that you're going to use. Um, get them all set. Get them all preloaded. Um, get them that so that they're rendered ready. Put maps on them, all that other stuff. And then set up a template with um, all of your schedules and your takeoffs, right? All those common ones that you need. So, like, have your, you know, if on your front page, on your cover page, if you're going to put the overall window schedule, you know, have that. But then have first level window schedule that you put on the first level. Have second level. Have third level. Have all of those ready. And then the third is have all of your sheets and views ready, right? So um, so that you can just drag and drop and put them on. And then even there's, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people know about this trick, but if you do, you know, A0 and A1, do A0.0, A1.1. So let's say you have a floor plan on page A1, 
but then you're like, oh, I want to call out, and I don't want to put it on the edge of my set. You just insert a 1.1, and then you have it you have it right there. So, um, and, and it'll take time, um, and it'll, you know, it'll take, um, you know, effort, um, but just constantly hone that, knowing, knowing all of your projects, and then keep, keep example sets. You know, every set we try to do, we try to say, this is the next example set. If you have any questions, go to this set. So you guys constantly updating your templates from job to job because you're finding that they're growing over time because you added a new view here, you found that something wasn't working here, maybe you changed a detail over here for a family. It's actually it's actually yearly. We do it once a year, um, and then and I think that's just because of time constraints. And then it's to see if that was just a one project thing or if that was a multiple thing. So we have a, a word document where we have suggestions to add. You know, to the template, and then every year around Christmas, one of us takes it. You know, over the holidays, updates the whole template, updates it on you know Revit Furniture, and, and we're good to go for that next year. Well, tell me about the resources you have on Revit Furniture. Let's talk about that for a little bit. Yeah. So the first thing is, um, if you, I'm sure Enoch will have a link to it, but if you want to learn Revit, we have a free tutorials on uh, how to make a cabin in Revit. You know, kind of using our system. And we base this off of, you know, what we do at, at CU and then kind of made, made our own thing. So if you're thinking about taking that step, just go through there. It has an a example file for you. Um, it has a, a PDF for you to look at, and then it has the videos piece by piece. And then other than that, we, we have we have families. Um, we also have other videos that, you know, you'll find it if you're just searching around um, the site. And then the last thing we have is, is the template itself. We call it the lift pack. And you can, you know, do multiple different things. But what that gives you is, is, is basically what I was saying. All those components, the template itself, all those pieces, and it lists it up. And then it gives you actual example sets that we, that I think all three of these houses are built now. Yeah. All three of these houses are built. So if, and, and one of them is a builder's set. So there's different types of sets, right? There's like a custom residential home. And then there's a builder set. And then there's, um, there's actually just the regular kind of developer set. So there's actually three kind of levels, and, and we kind of put all of those three in there. And um, and then it, it's the, I think, 395 families. So your furniture, your components, even a, a cool pergola that I made that flexes and does different trellises stuff. So that's that's what's on there. And actually, I, I want to give your listeners a special gift because uh, normally on websites that come on, you know, they, they say, hey, you know, go to go to this you know, page and you'll get a free gift and it's normally what they give everyone. So it's not really above and beyond if you would have just gone there anyway. So what we give above, you know, that's just regular if you go to the site, it's that you, you sign up to our email list and we give you the tools that we use to make our renderings look great. So it's places where you can get uh, Photoshop trees, skies, people, different, you know, places for tutorials and all that stuff. So that's just normal. But our friend uh, Derek came down and uh, he just passed all of his architecture tests, and he wants to go into residential design. And we kind of took him up. Well, he's thinking about it. Um, we took him around some of our houses, and he kept he kept asking all these different questions about like you know shear wall and how much do you detail for your electrical plans and specifications and all this stuff. And, and I finally got to the point where I go, Derek, I think you I think you need to flip your your thinking, right? So if, and he works at a big firm up in North Dakota that does hundred million dollar projects all the time. It's like hockey stadiums, you know, YMCA's, and that's a different level, right? You're dealing with the city, you're dealing, and not that residential design you aren't, these you definitely are, but to to take that where your perspective is and boil it down to a residential set, you're trying to cut off tree branches and you don't know what you know what to cut off. So our suggestion is start. From the bottom, start from the fundamentals, and think about. You've seen builders' sets. You you know you can you can download them and all that stuff. And think about if you're just working for a developer or a builder that does a hundred houses, they know how to build houses. It's no problem for them. They know all the details. They've done it literally a hundred. They make a hundred houses a year. How do you make a set for them in Revit? And what does that look like? So if you go to uh, RevitArchitecture.com forward slash bo architecture for business of architecture, BO architecture, there's a sign-up form, and we're going to give you that, that Revit file and the PDF so that if you're making, you know, a design on your own, go look at that builder set and just look at the fundamentals. It's not, you know, a great, I think it's like an eight-page set, 
But flip your flip your mind and just start to think about the fundamentals rather than you know commercial architecture sets are a hundred pages, and we've had we've had house sets for custom that are fifty pages. I just think that's way too much to start on, and I don't think that's the right way to start is to try to boil down all that knowledge. I I rather have people you know flip flip their their mind and start from the bottom up. And that's 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 just kind of what we want to give to your listeners because I think you give such a great resources and it it's been an inspiration for us to to help you you know continuing to pass along the goodwill. Awesome. Awesome. Well, well let, let let some of our some... listeners know what is Revit because there probably are some people listening that don't have a grasp of it. Tell us what this program does. Give us you know talk to us like we're beginners and just quickly see if you can summarize a little bit about what Revit is. Yeah. So. Um, to kind of give you the history, obviously way back everyone hand drew, and then people went into you know AutoCAD or something like that. And essentially AutoCAD in its fundamentals is just you know 2D line. It, it's taking your sketches, but it's making it more perfect and more advanced. And you know you can do some really fancy things with that, and it and it's worked well. The, so in a, you know plain talk, what Revit is is just the 3D version sort of of that. So when you draw a wall, it's making it in 3D. And then it's making that wall, so when you click on it, it can have properties. So those properties can be anything from you know what each individual layer of that wall is made of, to its fire rating, to so and, and in furniture where to buy it, and so everything is basically components. So you're building with advanced Legos is basically what you're doing that are smart, and that you can that you can manipulate. So you can attach them to levels. So then if you move a level, everything automatically. Up and it moves up in, in 3D. So, so it, in you know, if you were in AutoCAD, maybe you were cutting a section and you forgot to move that up. In Revit, that can never happen because it, it's always the way we model. You know, everything are always attached to you know levels and stuff like that. And then even you know your furniture. So your furniture is a piece that can probably flex. It has it has a material sign to it. And a lot of times, sometimes they'll have where you can go buy this, right? Because obviously they want you go buy their furniture or something like that. And it might have, um, so you can put all this information into it and then you can start to get information. So you can start to get, you can put in all your concrete and then you can just make a schedule that you know says how many cubic yards of concrete do I have? And it knows because it physically modeled everything. It knows how much it is and it just populates that. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like a plus one um, tool is how we feel about it. A plus one? Plus one. Plus one, so we feel, especially when Lance and I were just starting the firm, we feel like we were a three to four man firm because of what Revit gave us the ability to do. Because we could take those three D views, we could, you know, we could take those sections, we could take those calls, um, material takeoffs, just because the program allowed us to. Yep. Yep. So Revit, and you, you feel that it does help you produce those drawings more quickly. Yes, we. Um, not, nothing's going to be a silver bullet at all, um, but we feel like it, it, it doesn't – quickly, I wouldn't say is the only thing we're after. We're after doing it, trying to do it the right way. So if you combine doing it what we consider the right way um, with with speed and ability, I think it's at, at that perfect intersection. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> Nice, um, trains you rail. I've never never lost the the train of thought like that before. But nope. uh, I did want to ask a follow up question about Revit because I know some firm principals maybe are considering moving to it. Or there's so much talk and buzz about Revit. Yeah. What What would you say are the disadvantages of it? Because I know it can be it can be costly for firms to transition to a new technology. It it is quite costly, and I think it costs us. Six thousand bucks right to begin with, and starting out a new firm, that's a lot. They have Revit Lite, and I think now they're doing a subscription. So we paid six thousand, and then we pay a yearly subscription. So I think they've broken that down into a nicer, nicer thing. Um, downfalls: training. Training is going to be a downfall. You're going to have to bring everyone up. It's going to be a headache. We try to make that easier for you at Revit Training Firm. I'm sure there's other people that do that too. Um, and then also, it's not just training, you know, your whole office. Every time a new person comes in, you're going to have to take that time and train them. I, I don't think Revit, if you don't take the first two days, of, and we learned this with our employees, and Jackson back here working away, his first two days 
we're just doing training, and it helps out immensely. Um, other than money and training, I don't know. I don't know. I really like it. I wish they'd pay me for saying that, but <laughs> our sponsor today is Autodesk Credit. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk to Autodesk <laughs> about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So those are, I think those are the main two hurdles, and they are, they are real hurdles. Um, you can get into SketchUp and I think AutoCAD pretty, um, pretty easily. And, uh, not that they, they do have advanced features, but, uh, you can grow off of them. This one definitely takes, uh, I don't think it's a by yourself kind of learning tool. I, I think it would be super difficult to do. Yep. Yep. Alex, you guys, you guys are an ambitious firm. You're looking to grow. You're looking to get more exposure. In last episode, you talked about some strategies that you guys are trying to use or been using to get published in magazines. Yeah. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. So one one thing that I saw from from Daniel Leveson was if you guys followed him a little bit, he didn't get famous at least to the general public until he was probably I don't know how old he is, but let's just say seventy. It took him a long time to win that commission to do the Jewish firm and. Denver and then the World Trade Center and all that stuff. But what I noticed is, obviously, he, he, he was teaching. He had a firm before the, then. But he kept doing things that I feel like he wanted to do five years in the future. You know, like he kept, like, he, everyone knows, like, making stuff up. Literally just making up crazy ideas, stuff that maybe not won't get built. So every year what we try to do is try to do a competition of something that we really want to do that we would love someone to commission us to do. Mm. So I, I think our best example that got us in modern in Denver, which is basically uh, the dwell of Colorado, was it was 2012. So we said, oh, the world's obviously going to end. We're going to do doomsday houses. So we did a house that you know protects against fire, one that protects against earthquake, one that protects against a nuclear bomb, like it goes underground and all that stuff. So it was that, that really fun project that you want to do, but that you hope – you know, if someone commissions us for one of that, that's, you know, these are million plus houses. So, um, just always looking to, to the future and taking that, those, you know, those little steps or taking a little time out. Um, because, yeah, I, I don't want to speak for you, Enoch, and maybe you can speak to this, but you started this while you're at a firm. You know, you were thinking of, of the future. You were doing that one step up. And look, here, I mean, some people might, have, you know, how do you get into this? Well, you just started it and did the hard work, and I'm sure there's a, a long process to it, but wouldn't you say it's the same thing with you? You know, that's, yep. that's a good point. Start doing what you want to do now and eventually, yeah, because you know what? No one's going to come and tap you on the shoulder to give you opportunities. Right. Uh, that just doesn't happen. you got to go out there. you got to create your own opportunities. You have to make it happen. You have to. So the vision has to start with you. Yep. And I would say every every little one of those things that we did, even even – the, the Revit Furniture stuff, which was kind of just a side benefit of, of what we are doing in our firm, has always come back in some way to benefit us. So it, I would say it, it's hard to start. And one of the, it's, it's so fun teaching kids because, and you know, I'm not that old, but people a little bit younger than me, because the major difference between we see the kids, some of them are just rock stars. They're just, no matter what college you go to, they'll, they'll always be those guys that just amaze you guys or girls. It's actually equal. Um, and the biggest difference I see is that they will, you know, like if they have a question or whatever, they will just jump on it and try five different places or, or Google it. They're not afraid to, I don't know how to do this. I'm just going to try it. The people that, not, we don't have too many people that fail, but the people that, you know, the, they didn't do what they wanted to was because they were just stuck. They just didn't know what to do, so they didn't do it. And if you, if, if every time you can push yourself, you know, through that, and I know some of those things are hard to do. Like I, I didn't like calling firms for interviews. I call it, you know, 50, 50 New York firms. And I was, I didn't like it so much that like I would go up in a hidden place in, in our university and like do it away from anyone. And I, I wouldn't want to press the button. And the only way I'd press the button is just do it like that randomly and trick myself. And then I've been talking to them. So just whatever you can do to actually just do the work, that's where the answer lies. Excellent. Well, just do it anyway. Yeah. Right, Alex. Just do it. There you go. There's your theme song. That's perfect. Well, man, it's been a good conversation today. We've been talking with Alex Gore. He's the principal and co-founder of F9 Productions, a residential design and BIM creation firm. And he also offered the listeners, all of you out there today, 
to get some special Revit tutorial and tools at his website, which is rev revitfurniture.com forward slash BO architecture. So go drop Alex a line. Let him know what you thought about the interview. If you got something useful out of it, let him know. How can people get a hold of you, Alex? So um, go to either Revit Furniture or, or F9Productions.com or just shoot me an, an email. And uh, the easy one is alexkgore at gmail.com. So if, if you remember Al Gore, my unfortunate or unfortunate coincidence with the former vice president, so it's just alexkgore at gmail.com. Love it, love it, love it. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.